Dr. Idia Karna Sagar. Dr. Karna Sagar is currently Senior Director, International Relations at Nite University, Mangalore, and International Consultant in Food Safety. His major areas of research include food safety risk assessment, molecular detection of foodborne pathogens, virulence factors of pathogens, and biocontrol of pathogens associated with foods, diseases in aquaculture, and biotechnologies for health management in aquaculture. So this um, topic of this uh, talk is on microorganisms, how they are important for aquaculture. So it's very nostalgic for me because uh, I started my career, I came with training in microbiology without knowing anything about fisheries. So and I was trying to convince people in the field of fisheries that microbiology was important. It was in the late 70s. Aquaculture was still not a commercial activity then. There were no disease problems. So it was hard to convince fisheries uh, people that microbiology is important. But now once the disease came, people started realizing that microorganisms are important. So we need to know not only about the disease-causing microorganisms, but also about uh, the other microbes around us, because microorganisms were the first living forms to evolve in this world. So they have been living in, on this earth for more than 3.7 billion years, interacting with all other life forms, and they have adapted so well, so we need to understand them more. And they have been found everywhere, in all environments where they have been sought whether it is in the boiling hot water springs or deep in the oceans. At one time it was thought that in boiling water, microorganisms cannot survive. And what is limiting the growth of microorganism? It is not the temperature, but it is uh, availability of liquid water. Because in the deep, deep in the ocean, where the pressures are high, you can find liquid water at temperatures more than 100 degrees, you can still find microorganisms. So they are so widely adapted to all types of environments. And now we know, as we learn more and more about microorganisms, that the human body has more microbial cells than our own body cells. So it is estimated that more than 10 times our own cells, we have microorganisms in the body. So they influence our life and health in many ways. So we are only learning to understand this. And the science of microbiology again started with study of human diseases. And we know today with all the advances in technology that we have, we can grow only less than 10% of the microorganisms that exist. So we don't know about this 90%. But now with advances in genomics, we are learning about these organisms also, which are not culturable. So earlier, through culturable techniques, about 35 bacterial taxa were uh, known, but now it is slowly extending. So its number is close to 1,000, and it is increasing. So we are slowly learning about these microorganisms which are around us and which are playing different roles. Now, it's always good to look at uh, other systems. Now, as um, I mentioned we started learning about the diseases that microorganisms cause in humans. So let us see what microorganisms do in our own body. Now people are looking at the gut microbiome, so they are with advances in technology, we can study about the microorganisms which are not culturable also. So when we study a gut microbiome and oral microbiome, they influence our health in different ways. And they are also involved in different types of um, diseases, not only infectious diseases, but also cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, colorectal cancer. So number of disease conditions are affected by microorganisms. So the interaction between microorganisms and our health need to be studied more. And there is what is called a gut-brain axis. So the microorganisms living in our gut produce molecules which can act as neurotransmitters, they influence our stress and anxiety, mood, behavior, 
So in number of ways they influence weight gain, bowel movements, nutrient delivery, microbial balance. So there is this gut-brain axis which is influencing our health. So we need to understand about this and how microorganisms, apart from providing us the basic vitamins which are synthesized in our gut and they try to suppress also growth of um, pathogenic organisms, they influence the development, angiogenesis, fat storage. So number of physiological activities are influenced by this gut microbiome which we need to know. And another interesting observation now with metagenomic work, as if you, we used to think that in our body fluids are sterile. The cerebrospinal fluid is sterile, the blood is sterile in a healthy individual. But now we know that blood from healthy individuals contain viruses. Any low viruses have been detected in blood of all healthy individuals. So they exist in our body. What do they do there? We still don't know. And about 8% of the human genome consists of retroviral DNA, which is inserted into the germline. And the function of this is to interfere with the activity of pathogenic viruses. So they help us overcoming the problem of viral infections. So they have been living with us through our evolution. So they have already got incorporated into our germline and they are helping us withstand pathogens. So we need to understand these type of interactions. And apart from this type of interaction with our body, they also affect the ecosystem. So they provide ecosystem services crucial for all forms of life and global sustainability. So they break down pollutants, they suppress activity of pathogens. So we need to understand this ecological role of microorganisms. If you have to think of um, the interaction between um, fish and these microorganisms. And in other sectors, now for example in agriculture, people are already recognizing how to increase agriculture productivity using the potential of microorganisms. So uh, even big companies like Monsanto are investing a lot in studying this interaction so that they can use the microorganisms to increase agriculture productivity. Now another thing that I would like to point out is regarding what is happening in the human system. Now in human medicine they are already talking about fecal transplantation. So for many of the conditions, they say if you have the right type of microorganisms in the gut, then that solves the problem. So fecal transplantation is an accepted practice today in human medicine. And veterinarians are also following this. So now for certain veterinary problems, are also, also this fecal transplantation is considered. Now how much do we know about the gut microbiome in cultured animals, aquatic animals. And as I mentioned, the, there are conditions like the irritable bowel syndrome and other conditions which are affected by microorganisms, the gut microbiome. Now we need to think, now for example, we all know about the white feces and people have been looking at pathogenic agents, whether, what, is, what is causing this white feces. So we always tend to think that there is one pathogen which is causing a particular disease, but it is more complex than that. Now is this white feces syndrome something similar to irritable bowel syndrome in humans? So we need to think in these terms. So are the gut microbiome of uh, aquatic animals affecting these sim syndromes like white, uh, white feces syndrome? Only further research will tell us about this. And what can you gain from understanding the microbiome of um, aquatic animals? So could be, uh, probiotics are already used in aquaculture, but most of these probiotic research again came from the knowledge in other sectors, lactobacilli. Are these the natural organisms which are associated with the microbiome of healthy animals? So do we know about the microbiome of healthy shrimp in the natural environment? So the, uh, such type of work may lead us to some of the newer organisms, newer probiotics, which are derived from these healthy 
um, animals which are living in the natural environment. And one of the major problems in aquaculture, particularly larvae culture, is the mortalities at early stage. So survival is less than 30 percent. So most often we don't know. It may not be due to a single disease, but suddenly the larvae die off. So what is causing this? So it could be the microbial milieu around this. So in a natural environment, most of these take place in an environment rich in nutrients, rich in microorganisms. So how do they survive there? And why do they survive in aquaculture? So we need to understand the microbial milieu in which these larvae develop and that may help us to improve these aquaculture systems. So there are a number of existing technologies using microbial potential. Microbial molecules have been used as immunostimulants. Then of course the bioflock technology where you are trying to develop microflora by altering the carbon-nitrogen ratio. But can this be controlled? Now what happens if the, you have development of undesirable organisms in a bioflock? So you need to understand what are the microflora developing there so that you can, you can improve that. Recirculatory systems, again these are based on the bacterial activity degrading the uh, waste. So bacterial flora developing in filters, we are utilizing it in a way. And then bacteriophage therapy is coming, I'll be talking about a little bit a little later, and probiotics. Now of course this is a publication that uh, we had in the uh, middle 90s, so that time white spot had just come and we were trying to say that we can stimulate the immune system of shrimp. Of course that time there was a lot of skepticism about this, people said shrimp doesn't have immune system. But now we are slowly trying to learn, though they may not have a system that is similar to vertebrates, but they do respond to microorganisms and they do, do respond to immunostimulants and now it has become an accepted technology. And then again this work on bacteriophages which we published uh, more than one and a half decades ago in shrimp, we showed that using bacteriophages you can control the pathogenic organisms uh, which are developing there. Now we are trying to learn more and more about bacteriophages. Earlier we thought that bacteria were most abundant organisms on this earth. Now we are learning that it is not the bacteria but these bacteriophages which are dominating the earth. So there are more bacteriophages on earth than even bacteria. So we know very little about these bacteriophages and they may play a very important role in manipulating the microbial flora in the ecosystem. Now in, in human medicine already people are looking at bacteriophage therapy in a very serious way. The University of California, San Diego, they have an established bacteriotherapy center and um, now it is catching up particularly because of the emergence of antibiotic resistant microorganisms. So this is again an issue we need to think about. Microorganisms are not static, they are very dynamic, they are acquiring new genes. So this genetic transfer in the environment through plasmids or through bacteriophages or through other transposons and other mobile genetic elements is altering the microflora around us the emergence of uh, Vibrio parahemolyticus, which is causing AHP and D, which is having a new plasmid. So this type of new pathogens emerging may be due to this type of genetic transfer that is play taking place in the environment. And here you can see how the Vibrio pathogens evolved among, um, from the Vibrio ancestor, acquiring new and new genes. So this genetic change that is taking place in the natural environment is causing sometimes problems, so we recognize, but we recognize it only when we have problems like diseases. Now here, for example, you have uh, Vibrio cholerae, which carries a gene which is coming from a bacteriophage. Vibrio parahemolyticus, TDH and TRH genes again come from some mobile genetic elements. The HPND causing plasmid again comes from somewhere else, we don't know. So, we need to understand these dynamics of genetic change also among microorganisms to understand the microbial world. So this type of interaction has been taking place. Maybe when there are pathogens selected, we recognize them. So we need to assess the risk associated with this pathogen selection that is taking place in the aquatic environment 
and antimicrobial use is coming up and people are always criticizing aquaculture. So you can, if you look at the environment in the uh, internet, you find pictures like this, oh, aquaculture is very dangerous. There are so many antibiotics used. Shrimp is full of antibiotics. This is what is being projected by some interested groups. But uh, how much of it is true? So there are a lot of myths and truths about this antibiotic resistance. Now, did the resistance emerge only because of human use of antibiotics? No, if you look at microorganisms which existed even before human use of antibiotics, you can find resistance genes there. So the resistance genes existed even before human use of antibiotics. But it is true that indiscriminate use has led to emergence or selection and spread of these resistant bacteria. So we need to know about this pool of resistance genes which are present in the environment. It is no doubt that antibiotic use in aquaculture is selecting resistant bacteria. We cannot deny that. So we are contributing to resistance, but we are also getting resistance genes from the environment. So what are these genes which that are coming from the environment? So we need to know about this. So in uh, ancient bacteria, they have been able to find different types of resistance genes. They have been found in marine environments where there is no exposure to antibiotics. So these tell us that they existed before. But what are these resistance genes? So we are now only trying to realize that these are not there only to confer resistance to antibiotics, but they have a physiological role in the microbial cell. For example, this ampicillin resistance gene, AMP-C, it's a beta lactamase. It is involved in normal morphology of E. coli. So they have a role in the physiology. And there are many of these genes are efflux pumps. They pump out antibiotics. They pump out not only antibiotics, but also other molecules. So they are there to pump out molecules. So they are there because of exposure to several compounds. So they have a physiological role. So then beta-lactamase that is found in Klebsiella that has also a metabolic function. So we are slowly learning to understand this. Then what is coming from the environment? Now, for example, the quinine load resistance is very common in the medical field. And this QNR gene comes from Schuonella, which is present in the marine environment. So it may not be related to exposure to quinolones, but it may be having a physiological role. So we need to understand this type of role of um, what we call a resistance genes. Another common one is the extended spectrum beta lactamase or CTXM, which again comes from environmental bacteria. Now it is widespread in the human pathogens, but it originally came from the environmental bacteria. So the aquaculture environment is influenced by resistance genes and residues coming from different sectors, from human sector, livestock and other sectors. So we have a pool of these resistance genes in, in the aquatic environment. And resistance genes are selected not only by exposure to antibiotics, but also to other biocides, metals. There are these exchange of genes that is taking place. So it's highly complex. So we need to uh, realize the complexity of this resistance in the environment. And now metagenomic studies are showing that this type of resistance genes, the efflux pumps are the top ones, which are again coming maybe through exposure to other sectors. So in summary, what I would like to say is microbes have diverse roles in increasing aquaculture production. More research on microbiomes in wild and cultured aquatic animals would be needed. And microbiome management is likely to play an important role in aquaculture. Thank you very much.